shut the front door. It's time for marketing management. In this episode, we're going to be talking about product and brand development. Now, this is P number two in our marketing mix. Now, I've already noted the importance of feel. This is what we call the emotional benefits of a product or a brand. These are those deeper needs that we're satisfying for a customer. Now, it's important that we couple these with strong functional benefits. That way, we have the stake and the sizzle. Borrowing from Tim Halloran's work on brand romance, we have a brand pyramid that starts with product attributes. These are the what's and the how's. And the example that I'm going to use here is Red Bull. Thus, the basic product attributes that would be included here would be things like the style and shape of the can, the name Red Bull, the logos on the can, and the ingredients or contents of the can. Now, a key goal in this pyramid is to be able to build a brand in a way that creates consistent messaging and comprehension for customers. A good example of failing to do this is Mellow Yellow. Now, this is an energy drink that contains the word mellow. Last time I checked, energy drinks weren't really about chilling people out and making them feel mellow. And how about Colgate's kitchen entrees? Well, wait a minute, isn't Colgate a toothpaste brand? Yep, it is. Without this branding consistency, your audience will lose faith in your brand, trust in your brand, and they will go find another brand to replace you that makes more sense than your brand. You want to position yourself with a key piece of mental real estate in the customer's mind, an associated word. So if I say, what distinct word would you associate with the car company Volvo? What comes to mind? Most people say safety, and this should come as no surprise because Volvo has worked tirelessly across all aspects of their marketing mix to reinforce the sense that they are the safe car company. Their vehicles have tons of safety features. Their body and engine designs are much more conservative than many other car companies. And their marketing is focused around families going to things like sporting events together. These product features are key to differentiation. Think about the taste of Coca-Cola. Think about the shape of a smart water bottle. Think about the constant spinning of a Rolex watch or the shape of the dashboard in a Mini Cooper. Marketing guru Seth Godin notes a bunch of these issues in his book Purple Cow when he talks about how to develop an idea virus. Critical to product development is that you have to think about products becoming viral and how they can become viral as you build them. These cannot be an afterthought. Now from attributes, we ladder up to functional and emotional benefits. Now these are again a lot of the steak and the sizzle aspects of the product. Functionally, Red Bull provides energy and some thirst quenching. Now the size of their bottle is also distinct and helps with differentiation, but it's also deliberately designed to deliver exactly the right amount of energy and not too much, which differentiates them from their much larger competitors such as Monster Energy and Nas. The emotional benefits of having more energy is not foreign to most of us. It makes us feel like we're at the top of our game, like we can take on anything. Caffeine, Guarana, all their brothers and sisters, they all give us a greater sense of confidence and instill a greater sense of drive. This lets us feel like our chances of success are much higher. Now the next level of the pyramid is what's called the brand persona. And this is what I couch as literally, if your brand walked through the door, who would it be? Indeed, what we're trying to do here is to personify our brand, to give it human-like characteristics. Typically, the easiest way to do this is to associate your brand with some sort of celebrity because they're relatively universally known and people go, okay, I get who that person is and how they behave. For example, many people know about Leonardo DiCaprio, his heavy involvement in green movements, and also the fact that he's a really stylish guy. Sean White, Blake Griffin, and all the other Red Bull athletes work really well for Red Bull because these are the sorts of people that have a lot of guts and grab life by the horns. Speaking of consistency, why is Red Bull so named? And why is their logo two Red Bulls heading toward each other? The answer should be relatively obvious. Red is the color of fire and passion, and the Bulls represent something that's unstoppable. Ever heard of a bull in a china shop? With their product, they want you to feel unstoppable too. See what they're doing here? The next stage of the pyramid is a social cachet. Now that's a cachet with a T. If you take the T off, 
you're talking about a secret weapon stash somewhere that's highly social. Social cachet is what it says to other people about the fact that you hang out with this brand. Remember back to when we were talking about the social self and the ideal social self? This is about social cachet. If you drink Red Bull, it's probably going to say to other people that you're a fan of or possibly participate in extreme sports. It's also probably an indicator that you're a bit of a rule breaker, you're a bit of a boundary pusher. Now I drink Red Bull when I snowboard for two key reasons. Number one, it gives me the energy that my old body needs functionally to actually be able to go out and do stupid things. And number two, it's in my head that if I drink Red Bull, I will actually go out and perform better at doing stupid things. Now at the top of the pyramid is what's called the core essence. This is a brief statement about what your brand stands for. It's a distillation of all of the different components of your brand into a succinct phrase. This is often incorporated into slogans or other marketing messages. For example, with Red Bull, theirs is Red Bull gives you wings with three eyes. Now, if you ladder everything up from bottom to top and back down in Red Bull, it is all about energy and performance enhancement. Everything around this product is designed to deliver on that promise. As you're working on your brands, if you're struggling to find consistency across the different levels of the pyramid or the different aspects of your marketing mix, the chances are really high that you have failed to effectively define what your brand is supposed to be about and who your brand is supposed to be about that for. Now you can always do product line extensions or brand line extensions down the road if it makes sense to do so. But you have to start with a really strong core. Speaking of product extensions, let's talk about product variety for just a minute. Having a broad range of product offerings will not only attract multiple different target segments, but it also gives existing customers multiple different reasons to continue patronizing your brand. Let's think about Walmart here for just a second. You can buy food, clothing, lawn equipment, entertainment, toys, and more from Walmart. Now let me ask you this. What word does Walmart own? Most people say cheap which can have either positive or negative connotations about it. But what's important here is that their brand speaks to a particular target audience, one that is looking for lower prices. Importantly, the sorts of things that Walmart keeps in its stores are consistent with its brand image. Now the variety of things that they offer, the economics term for this, is called an economy of scope. Think about this for just a second. Imagine if you had one employee who sold hamburgers, one employee who sold hot dogs, and another employee who sold the sodas. This would be incredibly inefficient and very costly. Now, take a furniture store, mesh it together with a supermarket, mesh that together with a clothing store all under one roof. You wouldn't need as many employees as each one of those individual things would take to run it. These would have much higher insurance rates and much more overhead individually than Walmart. In terms of product development, we have something called the Product Lifecycle Curve, or PLC, which has the stages of introduction, growth, maturity, decline, and ultimately death. Associated with each one of these phases, there's also a customer segment group, starting with innovators, moving to early adopters, and then early majority, the late majority, and finally the laggards. If companies are going to succeed in the long run, they have to short-circuit the process of decline and death through innovation and product development. Again and again, and again, and again. As you build product features and service offerings, you want to build in ways that form stronger brands with customers. Near Isle presents a great model for doing this exactly in his book, Hooked. The goal of this model is to get people to move from external behavioral triggers like marketing messages or recommendations from friends into more internally focused triggers like boredom or loneliness or the need for excitement. The actual behaviors are the action stage of this model. And again, we want to make things as easy to do as possible. We don't want to frustrate our customers and leave them with a negative emotional response. Now we can leverage challenge and difficulty in the right settings in marketing sometimes, but we don't want to take something that's supposed to be easy and make it hard just for the sake of challenging our customers. Getting your rental car keys should not be an adventure. It should just be grab and go. As with classical conditioning or operant conditioning that you might have heard about from psychology, we want positive behaviors to be rewarded, but we also want these rewards to be variable. Here's why. Variability keeps people pleasantly on their toes. 
reduces the extent to which they're going to set expectations of what you'll do in the future, and also creates a positive sense of anticipation, just like you would have before a birthday or Christmas or Hanukkah or any other holiday where you've got wrapped up presents that you don't know what's in there. If customers always know what they're getting, it's going to take away from the surprise, and surprise is a nice positive emotion. Rewards can be feature-based, like getting your seat upgraded on an airline, or they could be more promotionally focused, like giving you a discount or some promotional swag. You also benefit greatly when you get customers to put little bits of themselves into your product or your brand. Time, effort, relationships, data, etc. How easy would it be for you to walk away from your Instagram account, Snapchat account, Spotify? All of your friends are there. All of the posts and time that you've spent putting things in there is all collected in there and stored. How easy would it be to extract all of that information and all of those relationships out of there and move over to a new platform? I guarantee you it wouldn't be easy. You have stored value in these things, which is really difficult to extract. How would you ever get it all back out? Sounds like a lot of work. The more we invest in something, the more we put time, money, effort, or anything else into something, the more likely we are to continue to commit those behaviors. This is part of human nature, and this is called commitment and consistency. Now, we'll see a whole bunch more of this when we're talking about personal selling down the road. Human beings are driven to be consistent in their behaviors, so much so that a lot of the times we'll make bad decisions and justify them because we already started going down that path. Well, I've already watched 70% of this awful movie. I may as well just keep watching it until the end. Have you ever been proud of yourself for watching a really bad movie and just seeing it all the way through? That's consistency. Let's talk with an industry expert who's developed food products and brands for decades about how she approaches product and brand development. Welcome to the show, Mary Drennan, currently the CEO and co-founder of Nourish Foods and plug for the website, uh, nourishmeals.com. Um, so you've, you've had a bunch of different roles, kind of interesting test kitchen chef at Time, and you ran a company called uh, In Good Taste for about six years. Now you've got this co-founded company, Nourish Foods. What's kind of interesting to me is, you know, looking at your background with, uh, you know, an English undergraduate, and then you went on to culinary school after that. Kind of at what point did you identify that this was a passion for you, that this was a career trajectory? I mean, was it, was it always there and you knew you were going to do it or did it just suddenly come up? Yeah, well, so in my, um, in between my freshman and sophomore year, um, I had a huge interest in cooking at home with my mom and she actually was the one that suggested to me that I go during that summer and work in a restaurant. And she's like, you know, this is a really hard career choice. <laughs> and I want you to like see that um, for what it is. And so she actually got me a meeting. She's like so proactive, but she got me a meeting with Frank Stitt, who um, is like the godfather of Southern cooking. Um, he owns a couple of restaurants here in Birmingham, Highlands Bar and Grill and Chez Fon Fon and Bottega. And so he actually sat down with me face to face back in the day when people used to sit down face to face, <laughs> kind of talked me through, you know, what his career looked like. Um, at the time, they didn't do internships at any of his restaurants, and I don't know if they still do or, or not, but he just kind of walked me through the ins and outs and the uglies and the, the good. And um, he gave me a list of people to call in Birmingham to ask them for a summer job. And so I did, and I ended up working in um, a restaurant in downtown Birmingham, and I was um, 18 years old, and everybody in the kitchen with me was a man, and, you know, obviously older than 18. So I felt like they kind of took me under their wing a little bit and, you know, just showed me, like, the ins and outs and what re really restaurant life is like. Um, and so I worked there every night and on the weekends and got a big picture into a career path that I really didn't want to do. <laughs> so so what my mom's talk. intention was, was to show me this, uh, hard life and I actually saw it. And so, um, but it didn't stop my desire to figure out how to work in food on my own terms. And so every summer thereafter and actually during some semesters at WNL, I continued to work in restaurants and got um, 
more background and more understanding of how that industry operates. And um, so when I graduated from WNL, three weeks later, I started at culinary school. Oh, wow. And, that's yeah. So that's kind of, that was kind of how I got my start in food. Um, but before I even went to culinary school, I knew that there was a framework within food that I did not want to pursue. And that was the restaurant biz. Sure. So part of what this segment is about is product development. Obviously, you've got a company now and you've had a company that uh, has to develop new products and put them out there in the market space uh, in terms of food. So can you kind of tell us about what it takes to build new products and to establish a brand around that? Like, what's your process? What's the method to the madness in terms of product development for you all? So we have kind of an interesting process and background to that. Um, my partner is more of the product development now than I am. But um, back in the day, she and I both worked at Cooking Light Magazine, uh, which was a Time Inc. publication. It's now shuttered. Um, and we did recipe development for that magazine and a handful of others within their um, brand lineup, uh, Cottage Living, Health Magazine, Oxmoor House, Coastal Living, Oxmoor House was their cookbook publishing. But so we basically would take a recipe and develop it from the beginning to the end with testing procedures to make sure that it would work 100% of the time for the home chef. Um, and what we were building at that time was a foundation of understanding how recipes work, what people want to make at home, what questions come up in the testing and development process that um, maybe you think a part of a recipe is gonna work and then when you actually get into the nuts and bolts of it, it just doesn't work how you thought. Um, and so that really kind of laid the foundation for she and I to be doing what we're doing now. Although we're not distributing recipes per se, um, we are distributing the fully finished product um, to people's homes. And so the part of the development for us that was the most challenging is our product is delivered fresh to our clients' doorsteps every week. Um, and it has a consume by date of six or seven days from the day that it's delivered. Um, so you have to think about meals in the sense, not like in a restaurant sense, where you sit down and you order um, the barbecue chicken and it's going to come out in seven to 15 minutes, right? And it's going to come out hot. So think about it in terms of we're cooking it here, cooling it, packaging it, and shipping it across the country for somebody that may eat seven days later. Right. And so it, it's a different product than what is going to be consumed on premises. And so we had to kind of like adjust our thinking and work with the recipes and figure out what reheats well um because not all protein is considered <laughs> you know it doesn't all heat perfectly again and then if it's something that's like a leaner meat for example like how do we incorporate a sauce um just those kind of things that like took us a couple years to um rework reframe our brain around that part of it um, you know, now that we have a team of people that work in the kitchen that are very creative, um, the product development does not fall squarely on our shoulders, um, but we still have a pretty heavy hand in the, I don't even know if it's called the framework, but like, you know, we do really well within this. <laughs> She's making me laugh. I'm sorry. Um, he's well, that's that's fantastic. Right? There should be at least a little bit of humor. You should have seen Corey yeah. Allison on here yesterday. Oh, really? <laughs> okay, so Tiffany, hold, Tiffany just held up a piece of paper that said old shit, which means like she wanted me to mention that like we try to have a no waste um, process here. So if there is something that is you know, going to go bad in the next week, for example, we will try to turn it into something new. Um, and it actually helps with our food cost. Not that people eat bad food by any means. Um, and I can give you some more concrete examples of that. But anyway, so um, that's kind of that's kind of our product development background. And then, you know, we do have some consideration for seasonal 
you know, the stuff that we would run today is not going to be the same produce that we would run in January. Um, or if we did try to, the cost would be just too tremendous for us to have it. Um, so there's some seasonality involved with the menu. We do have 10 to 12 entrees every week and we rotate those on a five week schedule. So between like 50 and 70, let's say, unique different items that the kitchen staff is required to know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So let me, let me ask you about that for just a second, right? So the, the answer in my mind is probably obvious, but for the sake of the people that are watching, why do that? Why have that much variety? Well, we feel like we can create a, a longer lifetime value for our clients if we are constantly giving them something new or something that they perceive as new. Because five weeks from now, you won't remember what you ate for lunch today. But if you ate it again in seven days, you'd be like, eh, I just had this, right? Um, and so we actually think that that's one of our key differentiators between us and the bigger players in this um, direct market is while they have probably efficiencies of scale because they're doing a larger volume of a smaller amount of items, we feel like we can actually keep that customer longer if we do give them more variety. Great. That's, that's exactly one of the things that I wanted to hear you say about this is like, you have a differentiator, right? So you've got this differentiating factor where they're achieving economies of scale, probably keeping their costs down, but you have a longer term, more satisfied uh, customer with a stronger relationship with them. Because as you say, every five weeks or so, it's like, you don't remember what you ate for lunch. You remember what was good, but if you eat yeah. the same thing every week, you're like, ah, oh, this is getting old. Right. Exactly. And then it creates kind of for our current clients, at least, it creates a buzz for them because they're like, ooh, that dish is back. I loved that one last time, you know? And so there's some staples that we do keep on there, um, but it's not every week. Do you find that there's a lot of buzz from your current customers to new customers? Do you all analyze that at all? It's really hard for us to track that just because it's all e-commerce. Um, and we don't have the technology, at least within this website, to track referrals. Um, gotcha. I wish that we did, because I think that that would be tremendous. You know, word of mouth um, is good for any business, but especially one of our size. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and thinking about, as you all are developing a product, you're talking about differentiation and whatnot. So you've got the overarching brand, right? So how does, how do you perceive those products as feeding into that overarching brand? And then how does the brand then sort of guide new product development in your estimation? Um, so we actually started out in this business as a paleo meal company. And we were servicing a corporate gym here in Birmingham that at the time had sold a bunch of franchise units across the country. And back in 2012, paleo was a really like new idea. Um, people could not figure it out. And if they did try to figure it out, it was like, I'm gonna eat grilled chicken and veggies. Like that was what they knew paleo to be. So that was what they were gonna stick with. Um, and so what we tried to do for this fitness company was create or demystify the idea of paleo and create meals that they were familiar with that were just converted into a paleo option. So we would do, and we still have some of these on our menu. So um, instead of like a chicken tender, as you would imagine it with like a flour coating and then deep fried, we did um, ground up almonds to create like a nut flour on the outside of ours and then we would actually bake them so um, they were a healthier version and they fit within the framework of the paleo diet and it really it gained traction so quickly because people felt like they were not on a diet uh -huh. right we kind of showed them like hey let's hold your hand and show you that paleo can be fun and, you know, it's not going to be as hard as you thought, and you don't have to eat grilled chicken every day. Um, and so the product line really started um, 
on that community. And we really cut our teeth on that local community where we could gain like really good intel and feedback kind of in real time. Um, and then as they expanded their franchise units across the country, most of the owners of those franchise units were in Birmingham still. They were like the original group of fitness people and they um, contracted with us to figure out how to get these paleo meals to their gym. Um, and so that's kind of how it started for us. Now we have moved beyond the consideration of paleo, even though a lot of those principles are still um, present within our product line because A, we believe in high protein um, and you know low carb. That whatever is the new word for it, um, it's all the same diet really, right? So paleo, keto, <laughs> paleo, keto, gluten-free, low carb, high protein, it's all exactly the same. It's just a new name. Um, and so we still have a lot of those options on our menu, but we've also adjusted um, to accommodate other dietary restrictions, if you will, or other lifestyles that people are choosing um, like vegetarian or dairy free or you know what I mean so we have options that are going to work for everybody um, and so we didn't want to close ourselves off to like one special diet per se. Did you hit um, a critical mass at some point that caused you all to, to tip over to more offerings or were you just paying attention to what people were demanding in the marketplace like what was the tipping point there? <laughs> well for us when we moved from doing private label for that fitness company to our own brand um, we felt like it was a good transition for us to get away from the paleo moniker. Um, and that actually goes back to our cooking light days. You know, cooking light was all about eating well um, with nutritionally balanced meals, but they never got on board with anything that was um, a short term fad. And we felt like at some point paleo fad was going to die. And so how do we, how do we kind of remove that messaging from what we do, even though it's still within our menu, we've just removed the name. Um, and sure enough, eight years later, like you never hear about paleo anymore. No, there's other, yeah, it's fad. Now, it's all, there's yeah. other names for whatever at this point. Yeah. Yeah. There's other names for it. So um, we're not trying to be all things to all people. We're just trying to be really nutritionally balanced. Um, and, you know, after eight years of this, we can see that the value prop that we bring is not diet specific at all. You know, that's not the problem that we're really solving for people anymore. Um, now the problem we're solving for is time. Gotcha. Yeah. In terms of uh, the question of the year and the question of the decade, right, is COVID and COVID impacts on business. So I'm asking everybody about this, of course. What have you seen, I guess, in your industry, um, really out there in general, the impacts of COVID on different industries and the ability to do business? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I would say, like, when we come out of the COVID slumber, I think that the food business will be the one that was hit most tremendously maybe behind commercial real estate. I'm interested to see what you have to say about this too. Um, so a lot of our contemporaries and you know, our friends in the food industry are having a really hard time. You know, they're, and I don't know if it's the same way in Lexington, but here in Alabama, um, people are very cautious of returning to that part of their lifestyle. Um, you know, sure. Restaurants are offering curbside, um, they're reopening and then the staff goes down with COVID. So then they have to close again. And then, you know, it's, a, it's just, it feels a little bit like a gerbil wheel for them to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, the beauty of what we had built is that we were already set up fully e -com delivery, we, didn't, we don't even have anybody that ever walks in our facility. So that part of it for us um, was a blessing, for sure. We were able to pick up quite a bit of business 
um, especially in March and April and May when people were starting to realize like, oh, I, I'm sick of cooking at home and I can't <laughs> go anywhere. Um, so yep. what are my options? And we were able to pick up a, a lot of business that way. But I think um, to better answer your question, I think one of the things that we did really well during the last six months is just kind of expand um, expand our lens of opportunity, if you will. Like <clears throat> we haven't operated a business in a recession. I don't even know what that looks like. I don't want to know what that looks like, but I'm fearful. <laughs> I don't think anybody that, wants to know that one. Yeah, but I'm fearful that if that is something that happens, um, you know, somebody's not going to want to pay a hundred dollars for meals anymore you know, when they feel like they could do it cheaper. Or, so I think that we have done a good job of looking at other opportunities um, to boost our revenue stream. And one of those ways is offering um, a low, lower cost product that we developed with United Way and we're delivering for Meals on Wheels. Um, strangely enough, the margin is a lot higher on those products than it is even on our own products. Um, and so we developed that line of products with them in mind, and we have now put up an e-commerce site uh, to sell that to the general population as well. Um, it's called the Eat Well Kitchen, um, and Jeff's doing a, a project. <laughs> Jeff's doing like a project on it, so hopefully he'll be able to share some of that with you guys. But um, so that that was one thing that we did, and then we also got a bunch of calls from restaurateurs and other food brands across the southeast that suddenly had no distribution channel for their goods. <laughs> now that the restaurants are closed and they're just sitting on a bunch of inventory that's about to go bad. So they called us and they said, can you use this in your meals? Um, and the answer was no, because our meals are already nutritionally you know, labeled and everything. So we couldn't all of a sudden just start making this heavy comfort food that the South right. is known for. But we were able to put together um, a distribution channel for those people so that we could sell their goods and fulfill them for them. Um, and that's called the Nourish Foods Market. And basically, um, it's farms and brands that are kind of iconic to the South that we have been able to kind of hold their hand and say, here's how we're going to do this. Um, and it's been really, that's been really fun for us. And obviously on those goods, the margin's really good because we don't have to produce anything. Right. It's so just it's really interesting. Yeah. This is a great point about, you know, branding. You know, so you've got Nourish Foods and you've got Nourish Foods market for those kind of higher end, but the separation with having a, a different brand for uh, the United Way, you said United Way, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. United Way brands and, and whatnot that are uh, not supposed to be uh, as, as a high, well, the margins are higher, but they're not as high of a cost of a product. Exactly, so uh, we sell those uh, meals online for $4.99 to $7.99. United Way, we sell it for $4.08 to United Way. Um, but so those meals are frozen and they are versions of what we typically would do at Nourish, but because they're frozen, we can make a bunch and just sit on inventory. Whereas with our regular Nourish meals, it's very customized. It's a $14 meal. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, yeah, basically it has completely similar but really different product feature outcomes right so enough to necessitate it's like we don't want to call this the same thing as this you mm -hmm. know because the customers that are paying for this and getting this higher quality stuff that's not frozen are gonna be really annoyed if you know if these other people are getting the same quality exactly and so we had that differentiator being that it's frozen um it doesn't have it doesn't have the same packaging it doesn't have the same branding it doesn't feel special um our flagship brand, the Nourish Meal site, is still much more comprehensive and uh, special feeling um, than the other two sites. But there is, I think that there's a thread of family between so that you can, um, you can recognize that it is from the same family. And the way that we actually based this on is like, um, you know Michael Kors? 
Sure. You, I mean, you do know Michael Kors. I mean, he was on not, TV. Per, not personally, I mean. Yeah, yeah but he. He's not, he's not on my speed dial. probably resonate with the women in your class more. But um, so we looked at it and we're like, okay, well, Michael Kors makes this handbag that's a thousand dollars. That's a crocodile handbag. I don't know. I don't actually have any. But so. I, I don't either. <laughs> the people that can't afford a thousand dollar handbag still want something that looks like it um but maybe he created something called the course brand or, and he did he created course collection that's like a similar looking bag maybe it's smaller and it's a fake crocodile bag and so that was kind of how we framed this is like that was smart of him because i bet that he sells a lot of those fake crocodile bags to target you know but yeah, this person can all there's only so many of these people out there. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's like yeah. Honda and Acura, you know? Yeah. You got all these different car companies like, well, here's the yeah. premium level and then yeah. here's the mid range. I knew, there's probably actually some like concept within what you guys teach that is that. Car lot. It's the car lot, right? Like you walk onto the Mercedes car lot and you may not be able to get the big SUV, but you can get still a Mercedes. It's just not right. the same one. Yeah. Um, so we wanted to be able to do that, A, to insulate our staff and insulate this business that we've built so that if the recession comes, we have alternate revenue streams than just the one thing that we do well. Um, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. And who knows if we'll ever build up those uh, alternate brands to be as big as the you know, the mothership, but you know, it's funny, Gavin, because as we've launched these websites over the last couple of months and we've started putting some dollars towards marketing, it is a totally different customer base. So I think it's going to be really, uh, I think by the end of the year, it's going to be really cool to see. Oh, this is amazing growth. I mean, since y'all started this, what, six years ago? Yeah, we started actually the private label meal delivery in 2012, and then we launched our own brand in 14. So yeah, it hasn't been that long, but it feels like it feels like a lifetime. Well, you passed you, you passed over the critical three year hump, right? I mean that that's where everybody tries to get to, and then they're just like, oh yeah, we've been at this way longer than three years. Oh really? Okay, I didn't realize that. Well, yeah, that, that's the startup failure rate, right? It's like if you make it past three years, you're probably good. Right. Every, oh, okay. You know, as a startup, it's three years. Once you're over that hump, you know you're you're uh, not golden per se. Cause, I mean, you can look at Sears and Blockbuster and all kinds of companies yeah. that tank themselves by making the the wrong decisions down the road. Well, so they probably tanked themselves by not innovating. That's a great point. At a time when it was very clear that they should innovate, right? Yeah, not looking at the uh, environmental uh, writing on the wall. Yeah. So that's what we are. We are trying to do that differently. I will say, like, when we talk about building these other brands, we're not taking a ton of risk in those. Like, both of those new websites I built for the marketing, like, I'm doing my own ads. It's not, like, something that we're really rolling the dice on yet. Um. Well, yeah, and you had a distributor come to you and say, hey, we've got all this product that we can't sell. Yeah. <laughs> Can you do anything with this? Yeah. That's a great it's, position to be in. It's a good position. And it's actually propelled us to be the one that receives those calls now instead of having to call to find products to stock. That's a good position to be in. It is, yeah. We feel pretty lucky. And I think that while this calendar year will not be our best year that we've ever had. Um, I think that it will be one of the biggest personal growth years that we've had. Fantastic. And we just, we just got the FedEx grant and the, and the, and the Alabama grant. So Tiffany's excited. She's over there like dancing. <laughs> Grant, grants are great. Ongoing revenue streams for business are, are the best though, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, they're not tremendously impactful, but um, it's something.
So, um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think this will be a, a great year for us at, as far as like us looking at growth opportunity from a brand perspective and saying like, okay, within this framework of what we do well, from high volume production to distribution, direct to customer, what else fits in there that we can easily do um, without taking a ton of risk and using our expertise of what we have learned for the last eight years and using that to be able to create new revenue. Excellent. Well, yeah. thanks so much for your perspective on product development and branding. Best wishes for a happy and healthy and prosperous 2020. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Well, that's all the time we have in this segment. In the next section, we'll talk about how to put a price tag on the value that we've created by developing these products and these brands. Until then, stay thirsty, my friends. Now, I've already noted the importance of that feel world. Now, I've already noted the importance of feel, what we also commonly refer to as emotional benefits of a product or a brand. Man, I still can't do it. Now from attributes, we ladder, no, no, from attributes, voice cracking all the time. This lets us feel like our probabilities of success. And the bulls represent something that's completely unstoppable. Ever heard the turn of phrase, a bull into China? Turn, that's not a turn of phrase. It does functionally actually give me the energy that I, my,